don't know if you can see him. He's got shit on his back. Another sheep stands over the top. He gets shit on his back. <laughs> Some things happen like that when you get them all closed in. There's a few of your rams there, the big boys. Basically got to go around the edges and look for the daggy shitty bits that sort of part of the leg there, not terribly good. Bits like that and they're basically lanolin caked in. Bits with too many grass seeds. And I'll go and pick those up. Bit of box no one plucked out from wool. Balls. The link wrinkly lamy. That's what you don't want. Very wrinkly looking butt. Ain't not too bad, you can just feel the wrinkles on. Some of them are like one of those sharpie dogs and they're not so good. As you can gather, she's uh, shearing day. Um, hopefully uh, I'll pay off the rest of the fences with this and uh, pay for me pirate book. Have you know, fun coming up to my nieces going, Ah ha ha, me hearties! <laughs> now they've got a tooth missing. Um, yeah, I'll have to explain how it all works and, and all that afterwards. Um, you know, we're just trying to get it done and uh, <laughs> you probably couldn't hear a damn thing over the noise of the shearing plant anyway. Um, notice these are getting very red very quickly. <laughs> Might as well tell you a uh, couple of stories. I've got lanolin on my hands as well as a little bit of dirt. Lanolin is the hair grease of sheep. Now that's where it comes from. Somebody from New York didn't even know that. Um, yeah, we had uh, somebody else come out uh, who has a couple of our sheep. I don't know if they bought them off us or what, uh, but every year they come out to get them shorn. One of them was only last year's lamb, and by hell, he was a fat bastard. Holy smoke, he was probably double the weight of most sheep. I had to pick him up and carry him in, and bloody hell, the damn thing would have been slightly over 100 pounds, or around 50 kilos, I reckon. Shit, it was heavy. Most sheep are only about 70 pounds, 35 kilos, something like that, maybe 75 pounds. Sheep was a weight, and... Uh, that's been fed a lot of treats and stuff, and it had lanolin like nothing I've ever seen. Sure, and you could touch him, and you could just feel it all over it, like it was really thick on it. Um, but anyway, they used some sort of a caustic soda thing or something like that to get it all out when it goes through the scouring plant. It comes out with a bit of dirt in it. Um, there's a place I almost got a job with that actually... They basically heat it. In some way they get it from where they scour it, which is basically means wash it to a commercial standard um, that they can then run it through machines, you know, like a textile factory, spin it all. Um, and as they do that, they get the lanolin out, and this mob then... When it's on your hands, it's a liquid, but for some reason, I don't know if it's the way it's extracted, I think it is, in the scouring plant, it actually comes out as a solid, and it's almost like... It's not as solid as candle wax, but it's getting that way. Uh, and this mob melts it down and turns it into a liquid again and throws in a bit of fungicide powder and a few other things um, and basically makes it into decking oil 
and you get out this sort of a like a sponge mop thing or a, you know one of those sort of crappy uh, cloth mop things that you you get that um, you guys know what I mean it's, it's almost like some sort of a squeegee looking thing um, that you can actually attach onto the end of a mop and then you take it off again um, and wipe it on with that or get it on with a roller or whatever um, yeah so that's sort of a commodity in and of itself that's usually used in hand creams as you guys probably know um, oh yeah we've had one break one of mine there's a way you get the wool and you pull it and uh, you sort of twist it between your, your two your middle finger and your other finger there and then you grab your two your index finger and your thumb and you try and pull it or you can just literally grab it with both hands and try and pull it uh, and if it tears uh, then it's considered a break and that'll happen if they're sort of like <laughs> not enough nutrition for a little while as we may have had during this droughty season season and as I said there's ones that um, occasionally you get ones that are, their bottom jaw doesn't line up with the top jaw and they will be the first ones to get that or any that you know might have got stuck in a fence for a few days and didn't get out or just don't have very good teeth or whatever in general and basically they've had a drop in nutrition for a short time there uh, I think pregnancy can do it too um, and yeah we've got one like that um, might as well explain what I'll show you later anyway the bellies because they sit down they get all the grass seeds in the belly so the belly area is sort of like here and sometimes with rams there might even be a bit of piss on the wall because that's they piss out around there um, and then they are really low grow they're terribly dirty uh, and then you throw the fleece out onto a table I am not so good at that it's a pretty bit of a skill to master it and if you don't grab everything all the right way and and that you it might not work out even if you're sort of goodish at it um, and what will happen is you'll go around where the legs are and they will also be dirty more or less from lanolin from their sweat and muck and the oil you know associated with that which will leave you with these little black spots which are basically like a whole stack of lanolin and the dirt stuck into it uh, and those you've got to go around the edges of your fleece once you throw it out on the table we've basically got like a tennis court mesh gate sitting on two 55 gallon or as we call them 44 gallon drums and that sort of stuff will usually occur on the legs because of where the armpits are sort of thing and the lanolin comes out of there because you've got bare skin there um, and as a result it doesn't have any wool there to sort of hang on to um, as much and uh, oh, they've got a bit of under the back legs they don't have any but the front legs they do have a bit but all the same it just tends to be the area where they have a lot of lanolin build up and yeah you see these black daggy looking bits and you've got to pull those off and throw it in and if you do indeed have shit dags you've got to pull those off throw them in they're referred to as skirting so you've got to get your fleece and get those shitty bits off otherwise the whole value of the fleece in general will drop uh, because it's dirty so you pick off the dirtiest bits roll your fleece up you sort of roll put the two sides into the middle and then roll it from the back to the front like from the back to the head basically um, and then yeah that'll go in wool packs your skirtings they go on the separate wool pack there's what they call locks um, which are basically sometimes around the head they go and start and they've got to restart or especially where they go in near the belly as they're starting to bring the comb in there's like a double cut and you won't get the full length of wool you'll get a bit that's only oh shit it's not much more than half an inch long you know 
and sometimes it may be three quarters of an inch long, but it's a uh, the outside of the wool, they'll get dirt on it, just, just the way it goes. Nothing you can really do about it other than put these little tarp jackets on them. Um, and basically, your outside walls always have a bit of dirt in it because it's the outer side, obviously. Um, the side against the skin stays clean because that's where it's growing from. And, of course, you know, it's going to rest on the outside um, and locks are basically you can tell they're missing the outside because they don't have that dirty little edge on them and they're always terribly short they go in their own pack as do bellies and also lamb's wool may go in its own pack but sometimes you tend to just throw it in with the locks because it's well, you, you probably don't, but if you've got a small amount, you might, because it's much the same. It's so short that you can't use it. And locks are basically stuff that's so short that it's not worth using. And so, um, yeah, that's one grade. Your bellies are another grade because they're very dirty. Your skirtings are another grade because they're very dirty, but also with a lot of lanolin. And then your fleece is your main higher-end stuff. Uh, and, of course, if you have any fleeces with breaks in them, you will tend to notice that it's not in one spot. It pretty much goes over the entire fleece. And they've got to be kept separate as well. Um, and, of course, it's all about really trying to get the best parts of the fleece. So you've got one thing that is high grade, and that will be a massive volume of that. And then all your stuff that's your low grade, there's small volumes of your locks, your bellies, your skirtings, and your lamb's wool, uh, which are all low grade, but you've got to get the bulk of your fleece as high grade so you get rid of all the shit off it and all the locks off it and the bellies and, and any muck off it um, in order to have a large amount that's a higher grade and your smaller amounts that are smaller grade, like, you know, they're... Um, In a small amount, you won't get much for it, and I'll give you an idea of prices. We've done a lot of crutching, and you guys saw that. Uh, the asses, we end up putting those in one pack. The heads, because we just do, you know, around the face to stop them being wool blind, they were sort of reasonably clean. We got 70 cents a kilo, which is 2.2 pounds um, in a kilo. 70 cents a kilo, you know, hang on, 700 cents a kilo, seven bucks a kilo for um, the heads but it was less for the asses because of all the dags and shit in it basically um, wool your proper fleeces it may be ten dollars fifty a kilo one time my uncle went in with a heap of old dags twenty cents a kilo and we had the little wool blind and head shavings, seven bucks a kilo, which is pretty damn good. And the reason was because they were very clean um, and they were reasonably long. Um, but when you're getting down to 20 cents a kilo, you're wasting your time even bothering taking in there. And there have been times where we've done crutchings before and it's been so bad with dags that you quite literally just load the bin up because you're not going to get anything for it. But when you're hitting your 10 bucks or more, you know, there's occasions, I think we've even hit $13 a kilo, you know, that's when you, um, you know, you got the good stuff and you make a, a little bit of money out of it. Any of those who think it's some big profit and it's some sort of a big blooming, you know, tax fraud, embezzlement, you know, you don't ever make money out of agriculture. Let's get that straight once and for all. You never make money out of friggin' agriculture unless you're growing drugs. That's about it. And uh, it's just the way it is. It's um, these other stuff involving taxes and whatnot where if it's classified as a hobby, you're exempt from any bullshit. And there's some guys who well, it literally goes through $75,000 a year with 
cars because the car enthusiasts, you know, buy one. One guy I know who used to buy a car that he always wanted to have. And the next day or maybe the next week, he would put for sale signs on it. And he said, I'd end up driving it for a few months um, before it sold. And then I'd go and get another one that I always wanted to have. And he just said you'd, you'd end up driving four different cars a year, but you'd get to drive all the ones you always wanted to own. But then you'd say, oh, what about all this money? He's like, well, he wouldn't make any money. He'd sell it for basically the same amount he got it for. Um, or maybe a touch more, but it was considered a hobby. you know. And some of these guys go through 75 grand a year with their car enthusiast hobby by buying and reselling cars, but it's all tax exempt because it's classed as a hobby. Our farm is the same way. Um, me and my father's farm are the same way, but on top of that, we have got a property designation number which you need for the purposes of disease tracking. Um, and uh, you need that, otherwise you can't sell sheep in the public sale yard. So we've got one of those, but at the same time, we're exempt as a hobby farm. So. Um, yeah, but uh, like I said, you know, we've only got a lousy, uh, well, we did have about 220, 230. Now we're back to about 130, 140. Oh, yeah, by the way, after we sold those ones, we had a whole stack more born, like quite a number. In fact, another 32 more that were born, and we've already done marking in... June, which is where you take the tails off and all that. Um, and now, what do you know? We've got to do it again. It's like we've got a double batch of lambs this year. So, some years <laughs> we've got hopeless numbers. Other years we've got 40-ish, you know, 38 to 45 lambs. This time we had a bunch in June and we've got another 32 now. So, we've had a shockingly unexpected increase in sheep numbers somehow, but uh, that's the way it goes, and I'm not uh, not against that. Um, <laughs> we sold them off thinking it was going to be a ripper drought, and it sort of has been, but it's sort of interspersed with uh, rain and whatnot. I should mention at this point, uh, on two days ago when I was at work, the harvest and all the crops, uh, as you would have just seen then, harvest and the canola over the road from your parents' place, um, yeah, so uh, she's all go and all um, harvest, shearing, all the time when the money starts flowing, and uh, I'll look forward to a couple more dollars to uh, pay the mortgage off a bit more. There's a couple of crap ones down there. My lot before the watch fence. And that's my father's lot there. So we've done alright. Yeah, that's my father's lot there. Yeah, that's my father's lot there. Yeah, that's my father's Quite a bit of wind noise here. They all look like Sean. Isn't that right, buddy? She's the old one I showed knocking on the door and her wool was friggin' crap. Weather beaten, frizzy looking rubbish. That's a few of them have got cuts, it's just the way it goes. Not much you can do about it. Years ago, they used to stick wood tar on them to sort of seal them, act as a bit of an antibacterial. Um, but uh, these days, you give it a couple of days and it's all closed up anyway. And uh, yeah, now this one here isn't. That's because he's too young and he's got a tail still. That'll be another week or so off. Uh, along with uh, a bit of butchering, and I'll have to show you guys the butchering. Unfortunately, for privacy reasons, I can't show any uh, 
shearing actually being done, but of course you can see that in YouTube and other areas. And, uh, yeah. These ones here are all only about a year old. The bigger ones are over there. I've just seen the old one before, she's full size anyway. That's the uh, table we throw onto, generally. Yeah, sir. And, uh, yeah, that's the. Uh, it's a machine. You have your own hand piece that goes onto the end of it, and uh, they usually bring that along with their own blades. That there is what you generally sharpen blades with. Big bit of sandpaper stuck on the big flat bit of steel, and there's sort of uh, some sort of a thing which hooks on that and holds the actual comb, and you have it against that and. Yeah, sharpens it. It's, uh, he's got his own one of that at home. Always need a bit of oil. Not a bad idea to have a bit of fly strike powder. And these, I think, is. Uh, we've got there. Uh, oh, is that right? Three point six amps. Um, the hell is that? 3.6 times 40, and you got your wattage. It's uh, another good one. Continuous duty, 50 degrees Celsius. <laughs> so I could run non-stop at 50 degrees Celsius, which is bloody hot. That's oh shit. What's that work out at? 125 Fahrenheit or something ridiculous. Maybe nearly 130. Um, yeah. Anyway. It's uh, all that done and dusted. These little beauties I've shown you here. This is the old style they used to use back in the 1920s, except this set is actually, is actually brand new and made in England. It's sold by Sheffield Knives and Cuttery and all that. Uh, it's, it's obviously a bit spring loaded to get some sort of a rivet through there. Back in the day, they didn't have any of that. Mechanised equipment, they just used to go and do all these sheep like that, but we use that. When they get cut, you have a little bit of skin um, on the wall. Sorry, that door keeps swinging in the wind. And so, if you've got a bit of skin on the end of the wall, you just come up and go and cut it off because uh, they don't really like skin in their wool, obviously. But anyway. It uh, looks more than it is because there's a wardrobe behind all that. A few cupboards. I'll close that bloody door. And um, but yeah, each one of these has been rolled up. Like I say, a little bit of skin. I'll cut that off in a second. Each one of these has been rolled up and then plonked there, and so on and so forth. And then at a later point, we get you the old day, move all the rubbish out of here, but get this old thing which is actually wool press. It's got a big bit. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's it, it's already inside. Yeah, you can see railing down there. This bit comes up and down based on cables that are tightened by a uh, crank handle that's jammed in down the side there, and that'll compress it into this. And uh, yeah, then you come out with a bale like this, really highly compressed. I mean, like it's just like solid. And uh, that's the industry standard way of dealing with some other bale there. That's the locks I was talking about. See, your dirty end, like that, that's your outer end there because it's a bit grey, a bit of dirt in it. And that's your end closest to the skin. Um, 
but with these ones, it's sort of like a... When they shear, they sort of overlap a little bit and sometimes they re-go over little bits they didn't quite get and you end up with all stuff like this and it's just a whole bunch of it that are rolled together into a ball. But th this here is pretty much... A lot of it is just short crap and uh, stuff that comes basically off the floor. Um, father will probably clean a bit of this up later. We've been sort of scooping it up all day. It's uh, always in a bit of a rush to finish, but uh, <laughs> that's the time we've been going since 7 a.m. So you, some of these things you just go, okay, good enough, close the doors and work it out tomorrow because you uh, couldn't really be stuffed to do a great deal more some days. Plus, sheep have got to be candid and let out and everything else, and this can look after itself until tomorrow. But, but anyway, I'll snip that bit of skin off. I might have to go out and can a few sheep as they're let out myself. There we all go. Here's old Shonky Donkin, eh? Here's old door tapper. Caved insides. Sometimes it's a sign of being hungry, but more often than not, it's actually just a sign of being bloody old. That is very caved in. Which means she's... got to be a bit more than three or four years old. I think she's probably near ten years old or something. But we lived to about ten or twelve years, and then that's the end for them, generally. Cark it out in the paddock. Hmm. Well, party people, uh, looks like my father's been going berserk. This here are the handful of uh, compressed bales. See, it doesn't move a bit. Not going to kick that, that will move. Ready old bales, but they give you uh, these the second hand ones that you get when you take these in, and they'll say, okay, you're given us so many of these packs, we'll, we'll have those back. And I think new, they're about 20 bucks each, and uh, we ain't really making a killing out of all this. And they always offer you to give you some old ones back. So we always get some old ones back. Now, this is the big shit storm here. And I was going to show this bit here. You can lift that and that's, you basically moves your pressing head. That hangs by these chains. Now, if I was to lift that right up, but I'm not going to do stuffy sting up this piece here ends up slamming in on top of here and by ways of these pulleys and cables and this mechanism which I hope we can see which we damn well can't and I don't have any torches here um, hang on a second there's another lot of Light made no difference, so I turn the uh, flash on. And uh, yeah, as you can see, a uh, big coil thing that she rolls all the cable onto, and you've got a cog system here. Very simple, big arm, and you've got some sort of a single tooth in there that you can stick in and move and then go around and go again. What stops it from spinning? This piece. It's as simple as that. Now, to release it, it's a bit of a not work safe approved, let's put it like that. Um, you've got to actually put this in 
bang. Now that'll go, that's a slot in there. And that'll go back and forwards. So you got to slam that in, pull it a little bit tighter, get your other hand or whatever, and basically, once you've pulled this, and it's, you know, gone away a little bit, you can get your other thumb or whatever at the back there, and you just flip that back, and then it'll just hang down level on its own weight at a 90 degree angle, pretty much. And, uh, yeah, for some reason we have a big square drive piece here as well. I don't know. That may give you access to a bigger handle or a way to hook a motor onto it or something like that by maybe another chain drive hook into it or something like that as a optional upgrade or something. Who knows? Um, <coughs> Uh, that there is supposed to be something that the uh, cable runs on, but obviously didn't work too much and just scraped on one side. Um, this whole square hoogla magoo will actually come apart, yeah, through a little mechanism here, and you can, yeah, I think you take this pin out, and this whole piece here which is hinged off here, swings out. And then this piece here is just sort of sitting over the top of that, and that'll just sort of, this whole side will pop outwards. And that's how you get them out. Um, you just assemble it, put the bag in, compress it, and then when it's all done, um, you basically just pull these, give this a hell of a yank, and it just goes plump, and pops out. And then you just sort of drag it out a bit further, and come in with your uh, trolley and take it away. Um, <coughs> now, this is incredible material. I mean, it's like bloody Kevlar or something. Um, and what basically happens is you're supposed to compress this to a point, and then you've got these dirty big ass spike things with like handles on the end you stab through at three different points because you've got three of them and those points should line up with your three grooves on your big compressing plate there um, and then you lift your compressing plate up then you chuck in more wool loose and then you bring your compressing plate down and as it's really starting to compress you pull your three pins out then you continue to compress it further and put your three pins in again. Now, you may be able to see, I think that's one's gone through there, and it sort of just closes itself over again. Um, incredible fabric, you couldn't really do that same stunt with other fabric, not really. Maybe with Hessian, but not not most other fabrics. But um, yeah, and you just sort of keep working your way up, compress more, compress more, compress more, and um, yeah, eventually you end up with something that is as uh, tight as a bloody drum. What's this hoogla magoo? This is a nice little weapon you love to see your teenage son with. It's to hold it on the trolley as you uh, hook under one side and to give you a bit more stability, you just... and then lift it. And as you'll see, you know, it'll stab in, but with a bit of stretching, that'll just sort of disappear again. And, um, yeah. Anyway, it's, uh, I think there's some there that are sort of gone. They haven't exactly disappeared, but, you know what I'm saying, it's, it's not exactly a, you know, massive hole that's caused the entire fabric just to tear from top to bottom, like you would expect, but it's... A lot of it's to do with the way the fabric's made um, for these bales. <coughs> but anyway, something I wanted to show you, and uh, this is the last one that he's just about to compress, and at least we've got a chance to uh, actually show you all that. And, uh, yeah.